everybody. Today we have a great uh, panel who are going to discuss the the always interesting and well, oh, interesting and stressful subject of quota attainment. So I know when I when I mention those two words, it sends shivers down everybody's spine. Like quota attainment. Ooh. So this. Uh, so just to uh, to let you know, this webinar is brought to you by. Sales Pop, uh, sales my online sales magazine. That's salespop.pipelinersales.com, and that's where you'll find the recording of this webinar later, and also many great posts and articles. Indeed, many from the guests that we have today. Uh, webinar is also brought to you by Pipeliner CRM, Instant Intelligence Visualized. We just released a new version last week, so I encourage you to go to pipelinersales.com to see the new features and take a trial if you haven't already. Okay, so now our fantastic panel we have today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let them introduce themselves um, so that uh, uh, they can tell you a little bit about each other. Uh, so we'll start off with, uh, with uh, Meredith Powell. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Meredith? Well, thank you. I am excited to uh, be here. I am, I've been named one of the top 15 business growth experts to watch. My passion is uh, sales and business growth in this new economy. So I'm the author of uh, four books, um, the two of which really speak to sales and sales growth, winning in the trust and value economy and own it, redefining responsibility. So I'm excited to be here today. And my passion is helping people learn to uh, sell better increase their results great thank you and ken uh thanks john thanks for inviting me our company really started on the premise that the weak link in a lot of organizations is a sales manager so today's topic is really great for that i've been a sales manager vice president of sales and for about the last 20 years uh consulting with companies around strategic sales management issues and business strategy so i'm really excited to be here one of the books we've done is on recruiting compensation, one on leading high performance organizations, and now we have an eight week sales management boot camp that we're running online with online videos. So a lot of great material, a lot of great background for our discussion today. Okay, fantastic, and Roy. Yeah, John, thank you very much. And, and again, just to echo my colleagues, very, very pleased to have the opportunity to uh, be involved in this. I'm. Um, a little bit different than uh, than my colleagues. I'm a former president and chief marketing officer with uh, with over 33 years of executive experience in not only sales but marketing, customer service, business strategy, career coaching for high tech startups, growth enterprises, and yes, monopolies. Um, I'm what you would call, I guess, a practitioner. My life has been all about execution, absolutely uh, idea generation, but. You know, I was paid to execute, um, as I think most salespeople are. So uh, it, this this topic resonates very, very well with me. As a president for a data and internet company, I had a sales organization responsible for about a billion in annual revenue. So fairly large commitment, took it very, very seriously. But currently, I'm a blogger, and I man, uh, market my own content. I educate, coach, and advise. And I'm the author of a five-book series five book series called Be Different or Be Dead. It's kind of an interesting title. Let's talk about how much science do companies really put behind quotas and how much of it is semi-educated guesswork? Uh, because I think when you, uh, I've been with a number of different companies and I'm sure all of you and you've worked with a lot of different companies and everybody seems to do it slightly differently. So um, why don't we start off with you, Meredith? How, how much science do you think companies put uh, behind quotas and how much of it is kind of semi-educated guesswork? I, I, I love um, this question because every corporate environment um, that I have ever been in, when we sat down to do quotas, I feel like we felt that we were putting science behind it. But at the end of the day, it was more semi-educated um, uh, guesswork that, you know, certainly there is a lot put into um, how to how to design the system, how to put things um, together and pulling departments and pulling teams together to put those into, into place. But <clears throat> but I feel like at the end of the day, when the actual um, you know number comes out there, more often than not, it was um, 
this is what we feel we can do. This is what we feel we can push it to do. And this is what we have to accomplish. And some kind of combination um, of those actually ends up, um, you know, putting it together. So, uh, so I, I do feel I've, I've never seen a, a quota system put into place that there wasn't research um, done behind it, that, that there weren't, um, you know, a lot of conversation and a lot of um, data pulled. Um, to put it together, but it, but at the end, I feel like um, I feel like leadership more often than not um, goes on their gut feel and puts that together. Right, excellent. How about you, Ken? What do you? Well, think? yeah, I think it, it depends upon. what well, I would probably think about you know, the companies that I've worked with and been involved in is the history of the company, maybe the size or sophistication of the company. Obviously, with some of the background Roy has, that, that larger numbers demands a little higher level, I think, of sophistication or access to sophistication and business conditions. So you have to consider all of that when you do that. Uh, I ran a company where we had five years of history by month by the particular area. Uh, and that was pretty good back then. And that was, wasn't gave us an idea of by percentage by month. So we understood that June was a much bigger month than February, not only because of the number of days, but just the market trends over five years. And so we also looked at some seasonal activities. So we could take a look at a variety of percentages. So when we got the number that we're really aimed at, we can sit down and somewhat scientifically be able to calculate seasonality by month, but also history of growth uh, of each area. So we had some sense of what we needed to do. Uh, and that obviously had to maintain back to what the headcount potential was. And so there's a lot of things that have to come into it. So a good sales manager, vice president of sales, president of the company, has to look at all that stuff. Size, access to data, what the business conditions are, growth potential or growth in the past, headcount. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Ken. And how about you, Roy? Uh, what have you seen in terms of uh, science versus a semi-educated guesswork? Well, I guess I, I guess I've seen a lot of resource applied to, um, if you want to call it the science end, I'll call it the kind of like the tool set for sales, trying to create quotas from a, what I would call a bottoms up basis. The problem that I've always run into is that when you apply the tool set bottoms up, um, you always, I would say, typically end up with what I would call a residual gap between what the sales guys applying the tool set say they can create in terms of wealth and what leadership wants from a top-down basis. There's always a gap. And, you know, I used to spend half my life trying to reconcile um, between the target that is laid off to sales in terms of what they need to create to satisfy the corporate objectives and what they think they can come up with using whatever kind of science. So my method was real simple. I handed the number off and I said, you guys go figure it out. Whatever kind of tool sets you come up with, you figure it out. And by the way, when you hit the residual, you figure that out too. You cannot come back to me and say, wow, I can explain 75 cents out of the dollar. You got to come back and explain a dollar, $100 out of a $100 target using whatever kind of tool sets you, you need. That was always an interesting conversation. But what I found was... Um, it was kind of like a hybrid process. There would be application of a tool set, but there would also be, oh my God, I've got a gap. How are we going to satisfy the gap? And that's where the judgment piece ended, it ended up. The real good ones were able to apply the judgment piece to a relatively small incremental piece in order to get to their target. The ones that were less able had a more difficult problem. So for me, it's like just depends on on the level of the target you're looking at and to as to whether or not the, the actual tool set is of is of considerable value or not. Yeah, I, I, I think those are all great points. And I, I like uh, I like what everybody said there. And I like I think every company believes that they put a level of science behind it. Um, but uh, the you know, I guess the proof is in their level of quota attainment about how good that science really is. 
Yeah. One place I worked, it was a, quite a simple process where the parent company said, here's your number to hit this year as an organization. And then we had to come up with quotas to meet it, <laughs> which wasn't a very scientific approach and obviously, um, you know, meant there were quite big fluctuations. OK, well, let's uh, moving on and maybe Ken start this time. Um, how collaborative a process should quota setting be between a salesperson and a sales manager? That's a really tough one because it really talks about being a sales leader, getting that number from management and having to figure out how to make it. So you're, it's, a, it's a really great thing to consider. And I would probably, in thinking about that, the, thing, the first thing that hit me was if I had five sales per people, that's different than if I had 200 salespeople. Um, in a situation where I have five, I really have to have buy-in and I have to have an agreement on that. So I think part of that is making sure that once the number is determined, the sales manager has to come up with a game plan of how he's going to sell the idea of quota to each individual salesperson. But the individual manager then has to sit down and be able to make sure that the salesperson has a game plan to achieve quota. And I think that's the collaborative process. Um, if he or she can't sell that quota or help them show them how they're going to make that quota or what the company is going to do to support them to hit that quota, there will be a disconnect. And, and that's a dangerous situation when you have two people working together closely with a disconnect on quota. So it's got to be led. It's got to be sold. But the salesperson has to see how they're going to achieve it. And I think that's the process you have to go through. Excellent. How about you, Meredith? What do you think? Um, I think it does. Ha I, I do really passionately believe it needs to be a collaborative um, process. And I think so even more as I work with uh, sales professionals mm -hmm. today, um, because people support what they help create. And I, I love I love the point that they're a part of how they're going to achieve it. At the same time, being the person who had sales goals put down upon them and quotas mm -hmm. put down upon them a lot of the career, um, it just you you never if it if it seems like it's too high um, a number or too high of something that you've got to achieve if you didn't have a part in it if you didn't have some kind of say then um, then you don't feel like you can you know it, you don't own it and I think it's very very important to have sales professionals own their sales goals their quota. Yeah, no, I, 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 I like that. I, I agree with that because, uh, I mean, if you think psychologically, if you're, if you have a quota imposed upon you that you haven't had any part of and you don't really see how you're going to achieve it, if you can't see the goal and you can't feel like that is something I can get to, the chances of you getting there are quite slim, right? Yeah, I mean, I just think that, um, you know, and, and what we're really talking about is, you know, how do I make my sales team excel? And yeah. to have your sales team excel is to listen to them and let them be a part um, of it, even if at the end of the day, to you know, I love the fact that you've got to sell it to them. But even if you've got to push them a little bit further than they, than they thought they could go, if you take that first step and allow them to be heard and feel like they got a little skin in the game, I just feel like your result is going to be so much better. Yeah, I agree. How about you, Roy? Um, how, how much collaboration uh, have you had in the past between you know the quota setting and the actual person who is inheriting the quota? But I never would believe, and it never happened to me, that I could make every salesperson happy. Mm -hmm. Never <laughs> yeah. happens. Sure, sure. Because they look at the world differently. And again, I keep going back to this issue of residuality. The salesperson will always come up with a number that's different and is on the conservative side. Yeah, sure. They're going to be absolutely convinced that it's great. The real issue is, um, is it significantly um, strong enough to, 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 uh, to get the kind of productivity out of the sales force that you need? I'm a, full be I'm a firm believer that it's the unknown that drives creativity. If I know how to get from A and B, the only thing I've got left to do is be creative in terms of how I get there. If I don't know, then I'm going to have to figure out what B looks like and look at the world completely different. So I'm one of these people that said, I understand you don't know how to get there, right? Let's kind of come up with a game plan and sort it out on the run. Um, and and so, you know, I think, I think the collaborative thing works, you know, in a certain respect. Uh, in another respect, it can never work. 
because you can't satisfy revenue objectives corporately if you do that. At least it hasn't been my experience. Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree. I mean, I think there has to be a stretch in there, absolutely. Uh, and you're right. I think that's where the creativity comes in. And to be honest, I mean, you want uh, you always want your salespeople to want to stretch themselves anyway because um, they should be looking to maximize their earning potential. Hey, John, just on that, what I used to do is I used to get the marketing guys in the same room. Yeah. That's and so good. when we started talking about quotas, particularly as it related to product lines and so on and so forth, I'd have the marketing vice president sitting there and I'd say, OK, does this seem reasonable to you in terms of the product plans you gave me? It sure it sure doesn't resonate with me. And so we would have a really lively conversation between the marketing VP, the sales VP and myself. Yeah. And we eventually we wrestled it out. Yeah. But, you know, it was never OK. Let's do exactly what the salesperson wants, because that never worked. Yeah, no, I like that idea, and uh, I think we'll do a whole other session someday on sales and marketing alignment because that's a whole other, uh, <laughs> a whole other sure. <laughs> basket of wallabies. Okay, um, so um, let's 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 get uh, let's get a little bit tactical right now. Maybe uh, Meredith, if you want to start this off, you know, what what are some of the common mistakes made when setting quotas that you've seen? Well, I mean, I, I think we just talked about a big one, and that's um, and, and I'm I'm still on the line of you know I think one of the biggest is not inviting, not including the people that have to uh, you yeah. know that have to carry out um, the you know that have to achieve uh, you know that have to achieve the quota. I always say the question of what belongs to you, you can set the number, but the question of how you know really belongs um, you know really belongs to them. The other is that I feel like. Um, you know, in in setting quotas, some of the biggest mistakes that um, that I have seen is that you're not um, th you're not putting together um, numbers that make sense year over year over year over year. There has to be for the people who are out in the field trying to um, hit the goals. There's got to be some alignment from one year to the next. If you shift the product mix um, uh, up too much, if you shift, you know, what customers you'll accept over over what you have done um, the year before. But you, you, there has to be some alignment to it um, year over year. The other is they have to be um, they have to be obtainable. I mean, you've got to, you've got to take into place um, marketplace um, factors, things shifting in the economy, or setting or setting a blanket quota for a national um, company, and not really thinking about what certain markets, um, you know, what certain markets uh, allow, and what other, you know, what other ones don't. So, um, giving some level of uniqueness and some level of of, uh, of individuality um, to it. So, those are just three or four. Um, you know, basically off the top of my head. Yeah, excellent. Um, and how about uh, you, Ken? What do you think some of the common mistakes are? Well, common mistakes uh, at a corporate level are simply, you know, adding 15% or X percent <laughs> to last year and going forward. Yeah. Uh, as Meredith said, business conditions change, headcounts change, product mix change. One of the other mistakes sometimes are made is if you're linking compensation with quota. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. Sometimes it works, sometimes it shouldn't work. Uh, compensation is a whole different story. But some of the mistakes they have, if they're, they're not setting quota linked to compensation, or sometimes they are. So that's one mistake I've seen. People haven't really strategically thought through what they need to do around uh, compensation and or quota setting. Mm -hmm. Number three, I think they, uh, when you talk about size, but they really haven't set up the competitive nature of their product. Are they in a growth stage? Uh, are they really in a declining maturity stage? They don't consider what stage of the product or what stage of the industry or what stage of company they're really in because that all impacts the growth factor. Yeah, no, I think those are those are very good points. And I think, like you said, also, um, you know, the how they set up the 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 quota, you know, new business versus recurring business. Are there more, exactly? Are there incentives for new business? What is what is the mix that you want? There's a number of things I think go into that. Um, what about you, Roy? What are some of the uh, mistakes you've seen when setting quotas? Um, well, I think the bottoms up thing we've we've mentioned, and I honestly do think it has extreme limitations and needs to be looked at really really carefully. So I won't won't touch on that. There's a couple of other things they are slightly different that, than what everybody's talking about is, is one is that 
Um, I think it's a mistake um, at a more granular level not to reserve a cer certain amount of the quota at the salesperson level for competitive winbacks. It's been my experience that, that the unfaithful, quote unquote, needs some attention and should somehow be reflected in the quota setting process so that you can drive specific activity. Uh, if it's not there, um, you have no way of, of kind of measuring whether it's happened. Um, the second thing is, um, I think it's a mistake to include more than simply organic volume growth in quotas. I've seen quotas that are laden down with assumed price increases, you know, market expansion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, looking for the new stuff to add on to a smaller base to make the number. The problem is sales reps shouldn't get credit for price increases. That's a marketing function. And yet I've seen organizations include that. And so, you know, it masks the productivity of sales, even though a quota could be attained. It, it's it's kind of being attained not on the backs of organic growth, which I think should be the prime driver of, of quotas. Another thing that I, I think is a mistake is, is there's a lot of times where numbers are are created with with a with a, a not a substantial amount of understanding as the client potential. I mean, this whole thing about you know value creation and and understanding the drivers of potential. Speaking of the science, particularly at the client level, I think needs to be refined, needs to be enhanced. And and when that's done, I think salespeople. And there's a lot of marketing involvement in this, clearly to help with modeling and so forth. And when that's done better, I think the quota setting process will be a little more efficient. The last thing I just want to make, and I, I think it was Meredith that mentioned it earlier about the granularity. I mean, I don't think that there's enough granularity on quotas so that sales management can actually see whether or not the quota that the sales rep is, is actually considering is physically possible. I mean, I used to see some quota plans with, with down at the activity level that required the rep to basically work 150 hours a, a day or a month. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just can't do it. So from a test of reasonableness point of view, the reps need to create kind of like a template in, an, in sufficient detail so management can look at that and say, you know, guy, you're smoking rope. That's never going to happen. Go back and sort it out. And I think it's a mistake when we don't get that level of detail um, to actually be able to understand whether the quote is achievable or not. Yeah. And that's why I think it, yeah, it's so important to have somebody at the table who, um, who, who, who sells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a, part, a, a a critical thing. And as well, I think there's another thing that I see come into play a lot is, you know, let's face it, in most organizations, you're pushing really hard at the end of the year to bring in this year's revenue, right? And then by the time you get around to setting the targets and quotas for next year, it tends to be done in a time crunch. Where, and so a lot of it is you know, there isn't there isn't the time or energy devoted to uh, to the granularity levels you're talking about because there's just not that enough time allocated. That's a really that's a really excellent point. I mean, I used to start the 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 um, the sales target process in uh, in October for the following year. The sales guys weren't really happy about that because they were doing what you just said. They were they were out there flogging, trying to make their number. Yep. The problem is if you don't stop the process, then it never gets better. Mm -hmm. Right. So you need to factor that into how you set quotas in the first place. They, you need to have time to have 12 months of activity, not nine months. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. OK, let's. Um... Let's switch gears from the talking about management and setting quotas and to the actual salesperson themselves. What are some of the ways individual salespeople can set themselves up for quota success? Uh, Ken, why don't you start with this one? Well, it's interesting. I'm just going to make a comment on Roy's last comment. In reality, the salesperson only has 10 and a half months to do a 12-month quota because vacations, sick days, holidays, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So most salespeople don't recognize that. So part of the thing that's really critical, I think, and what we've done with many of our clients over the years, we create something called a six month salesperson business plan. And that business plan is part of the collaborative approach that Meredith was talking about. 
it's uh, the salesperson actually sits down and, and discusses what their personal goals are, uh, both uh, non-revenue and, and revenue, what their training needs are for them to succeed. And then they, we have them forecast three times their quota. Uh, and then we build a activity model. Uh, and then we ask them to forecast the lowest minimum, high, um, best shot, and highest amount they can do. And then we have them build a mini marketing plan <clears throat> two or three activities each month that they have to do outside of what marketing is going to do. So between the sales manager and the sales person, they create this six-month game plan that goes back and forth until the sales manager uh, agrees with it. Uh, so it gives them a proactive approach of achieving their quota. Number two, I think that they also need to think about uh, setting some stretch goals so that they are really – knowing that they have to hit 125% of the number. And if they're thinking in that mindset, if they fall short, they still hit that 100% number. So I think having that proactive game plan probably is the most important thing. A lot of people sit back and are opportunistic in their approach. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Absolutely. How about you, Meredith? What do you think some ways salespeople can set themselves up for quota success? You know, I always tell people that the first thing that you want to do when it comes to the quota, if you want to not only achieve it, but blow past it, is to forget about it. Um, uh, I've, I've seen more salespeople get their head all screwed up because they're so paranoid um, about the quota. Um, so that's that's the first thing is that um, because, you know, you so agree, you've got to have a plan. You know, you've you've got to have a process. Ken is, Ken is exactly uh, right about that. You've got to know how much networking you're going to do. You've got, you've got to be clear on your prospects. You've got to know how many sales calls it takes a week, how many sales follow-up um, calls it takes a week. So get your process down. Know, know the behaviors that you're going to go that that you're going to um, to go after. Then understand that sales is a lifestyle. It's not a task. It's not something we do on Monday and Tuesday. And because we hit our goal, we don't do it Thursday and Friday. Sales is doesn't make any sense. I don't know why I make a, a you know gazillion calls in the month of February and I don't close any business in the month of March. I make the same amount of calls in March and I close two times the business. There's law of left field. There's so many things happening. So that consistency um, in behavior. And then the other, which is one I care so much about, that is to hold yourself accountable, to 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 look at the sales behaviors and see what's working and what isn't. I always tell sales professionals, you are your best coach. Track the behaviors that you do, learn which behaviors are working, which things need to change, and be constantly adjusting um, your sales process. But know there's a quota out there. I mean, if I had to say anything, it's get that quota out of your head, work a process, make it a lifestyle. Hold yourself accountable so you learn and you can make you can make changes consistently. You can do more of what you're doing well and less of where you're wasting your time. Yeah, I love that. Uh, basically, look on everything you do in a in a dynamic yes. fashion. That's, that's fantastic. Yes. How about you, Roy? What could what are some of the ways salespeople can set themselves up for success? So, so what I've observed, you know, looking at at the guys that have been, you know to the other points that have been made here, successful over time and not not like the kind of one sale or one hit wonders that, that walk among us. Um, the sort of things that I notice about them is, is like the following. First of all, these people really get the strategy of the organization. At a very intimate level, they are able to translate what the organization wants to do and what they have to do to satisfy it through a quote plan. They really get it. Um, the second thing is they have excellent relationships with marketing. They look at marketing as kind of a support vehicle to help them during the year. You know, they, they relate well to them. They network with them. They're friends with them. They're asking them for support and they're doing whatever they can to support the marketing effort as well. So it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship. The third thing that I've seen is their quota plan which, yes, I agree, we need a sales game plan. The, the quota plan is really simple. They tend to focus on as few clients as possible, and they try and contain the geographic distribution of those clients to minimize the amount of time it's going to take to do the hits. So they're really thinking through effort versus payback. Um, another thing that they do well is they look, at, they look at solutions that can be replicated across the client set that they have. 
you know, looking for that, again, that productivity piece, if I have a solution that I can, I can apply to 75% of my target uh, customer group that's going to drive my quota, that's a lot better than looking at a solution that applies to 10%. Um, the other thing is these people are really good at taking what I would call a body blow. In other words, all, there's always going to be unforeseen events that's going to disrupt the quota plan. No quota plan ever works the way the sales rep thinks it will work. It's just not going to happen. The real good ones are good at getting ready in terms of how they're going to recover. I'm going to come back to this a bit later because it's an absolutely critical piece in my, in my opinion. They're really good at taking the body blow and responding in a very positive way that keeps the momentum going forward. Um, the other thing is they're, they're very, very, very efficient and effective in terms of keeping the medium to long term in mind, even though they may be in a 12 month plan. They recognize that that medium to long term view very, very soon is going to be today. And so they better do things that make sense relative to that longer term view, even though they're probably getting paid for a 12 month kind of cycle. The really good ones get the fact that this is going to be replicated again next year. So I better make sure that I'm looking at things in a little longer term. Um, the other thing is um, these people are really good at going beyond what customers need. The need thing is pretty much, well, I, I, would, I would say, um, is, is kind of like commodity kind of behavior from a sales point of view. The ones that are really good get to what I call customer secrets. You know, the intimate things about a client that nobody else but this person knows. And they're able to leverage those secrets into rich sales, not just, not just kind of like uh, bread and butter stuff, but solutions that drive premium margins. Mm -hmm. and, and they do it regularly. The last thing Good point. that I see is a successful person relative to quota has done an awful lot of work on figuring out how they're unique relative to every other sales rep around them. Uh, in my world, I call it an only statement. They're the only ones that do what they do. And when they reach that point, they're able to execute, you know, in a way that says, okay, I can answer the question, why should you do business with me as opposed to anybody else? That's a tough question for anybody to ask, um, but it's so critical. They spend a lot of time trying to figure out what makes them special, what makes them unique. They will go out of their way to avoid the whole copycat syndrome, which is running rampant in organizations today anyway. Right. Once they've got that, man, do they know how to market their specialty to clients? And I think that's part of the quota building process because it gets to what Meredith said earlier, it's, it's the how. It's yeah. the how do I get the number? I get the number by being different. So let's flip that on its head a little bit with the next question. And maybe Meredith, if you want to start off, what are some of the mistakes salespeople make that sabotage reaching their goals? So we were talking about some of the things they can do to set themselves up for success. What are some of the things you've observed where salespeople sabotage themselves? And maybe they do it like unconsciously, because a lot of the times, you know, when people sabotage themselves, they do it unconsciously. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, I do think that they do. And, um, you know, the, some of the biggest mistakes I see them make, and, and we've alluded to some of them, I think it's, you know, wasting time, chasing, um, chasing deals that um, aren't going to be the uh, return on investment that, you know, that they're looking for, that even if they landed the deal, um, a, the chances of them landing them are are weak. But even if they landed the deal, it's it's not going to move. It's not going to be a long term um, relationship. Um, another mistake I think that <clears throat> salespeople make in um, in the quota is that they start and they stop selling. Is um, I've seen this a lot in my career. Is that you know once you've achieved the quota for the month, you take your foot off the gas because you know you you don't have to worry about it until the following uh, month. And I said this before. I mean, sales very much is a um, you know is a lifestyle, and it's something that you need to be doing all the time. You're not really sure, especially in today's economy and how the economy's changed. Mm -hmm. The fact that competition is so different, the consumers in control. Um, you know that that is you know that they don't they don't stay they don't stay at it they're not constantly working to reach or excel the quota i don't think salespeople um build enough relationships i don't think that um 
they spend enough time really realizing how long the lead cycle um, mm -hmm. can you know, can be, and um, and then s selling in the short term, not for the um, long term. The, uh, you know, we've made the point, and I've heard it so much today, is that this this number comes down from on high, right. you know, kind of from Mecca or whatever, <laughs> and um and um and you you know and and how you actually have to massage that to make it work, it, and and um to make it work in the marketplace. A really good salesperson will take that and say, I can feed the beast, but still set myself up to really take care of my customers and therefore ensure that I achieve the goals in um, in the long run. And and not not just taking those numbers at face value and not putting any strategic sales process and alignment um, behind that is 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 really a mistake because then they're just in this constant stress mode of I made quota I didn't make quota then the new numbers come down for the following year and they almost have to start you know um, start all over again the last I'm going to say and I I could go on all day is <laughs> they don't learn from their mistakes I mean uh -huh. you'll see salespeople do the same thing over and over and over again I see it so much now because how we sell in today's economy is so different than how we used to sell and they're still using strategies the biggest mistake i make is using sales strategies designed for a different marketplace a different um uh customer and a very different sales cycle yeah those those are those are great points uh, and i think that's uh you know that's why it, you know obviously coaching and management comes into play when you see salespeople constantly you know making the same mistake or using outdated um, methods. Um, Ken, how about you? What are some of the ways you've seen that uh, salespeople can sabotage reaching their quota? Well, I mentioned a moment ago about not having a stretch goal, mm -hmm. but I, I'll take a little different approach. I think I think it has to do with the emotional side of the salesperson not having a vision or a personal objective for achieving goals. So if I want a new boat, I want a new boat. I know I can achieve that boat if I hit my quota. So I need a vision, number one. Number two, it's the emotional part of maybe hanging with the other salespeople who aren't making quota. Um, and that's that whole mental game, a mental toughness issue that you have to hang with winners. Right. I think that's something that's an important element to do. And that's, so I take a little different issue if, if you are thinking you're not going to achieve it, you won't achieve it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's partly how do, how, how do you set the tone for your personal life as a salesperson to have a vision and goal and objective for achieving that? I think those kind of emotional things help that salesperson when things are tough to push through. And once they can push through that wall and start to see it or hear others achieving it, then it's a more effective way for them to win. Totally gets you on the robotic attempt of sales process. I think salespeople need to be more creative, uh, and they need to do a whole lot of different things from that perspective. But I'll s just stop with making sure they believe they can achieve it and have a vision and an objective and a goal for doing that. Excellent. Um, how about you, Roy? What are some of the some of the things you've seen people do to sabotage reaching their quota? Yeah. Okay. I just a couple of points here. Uh, the, the first one we kind of mentioned is it, I, I actually think lack of granularity and that that uh, that is on un, is unable to inform the rep of how to execute their plan is a huge mistake they made. And, and they're just doing it to themselves when they don't have, you know, the detail that they need to, to understand the specific executional elements. Also agree about not learning from mistakes. I mean, holy smokes. I mean, it, it's just almost like. People, certain reps are just unwilling to abandon the stuff that doesn't work. They just stick to it and stick to it and stick to it. It drives me freaking crazy. <laughs> Anyways, enough of that. Uh, chasing things that, that they like to do, um, not have to do. I've, I've coined a phrase on this, which you may find interesting. I call it the yummy incoming. And the yummy, in, yummy incoming are sort of over the transom requests that sort of come in and, and start demanding a certain amount of their time and they chase it because it's fun to do and it satisfies their appetite, hence the yummy incoming. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of reps do that as opposed to staying focused on the plan. And it's like satisfying that, that sort of visceral part, which we know they have, and that's important to a degree, but when done, you know, excessively, it, 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 
it, they're basically doing it to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, some of them apply what I would call the flogging mentality um, that, that's, that does it to them. I call it, I, I call it flogging products as opposed to sticking to the, to the plan about creating value and building relationships that yield constructive results. Sometimes they go to pressure task tactics and it's probably because they're under, under pressure relative yeah. to their, their quota. And unfortunately, the client on the receiving end of that isn't always that happy to get flogged at. And we all, all know what happens. The last thing I just want to mention is I think it's a huge mistake. And I, I'm absolutely not a fan of benchmarking and best practices. Um, and if you read any of my work, you'll, you'll see it in spades. I think a huge mistake um, from a sales rep point of view is, is going into the copying mode and say, well, you know, it worked for, for, for Jim. So it should work for me. Well, the reality is you're not Jim. A certain part of it might work, et cetera, et cetera. But a whole mindset about copying what other reps do in their own company or any other organization, I think is a huge setup for failure as opposed to discovering what works for you, what makes you special, and then going down that route. Right. That's a good um, and segue in some ways uh, to our next one, which, uh, you know, maybe, Ken, you want to start off with. So sometimes, you know, you get into your year and you're not you're not you're you're behind in your quote. And maybe it's not because you've done anything wrong. You know, maybe it's what Meredith said. It's that left field thing about uh, you've done everything, but the, the deals haven't come in. So what are some of the remedial things you can do when you see your quota slipping out of reach and the year is slipping away? What, how would you advise a salesperson? What would you advise them to do? Um, been there, done that. So I think I, this one, this one is very <laughs> important. Um, you know, the first thing that when we go into organizations and, and they're not achieving their quota overall or they're having problems is we take a look at an account planning process and really do uh, an active cross-sell and upsell analysis mm -hmm. and put a game plan in place that, uh, gee, I've, this client has bought these five products, but they haven't bought these three products. And they develop a game plan where each week they're going to attack 10 clients to try to upsell or cross-sell them into some other issues. So again, a proactive plan. Second thing, uh, we call it a business ecosystem partner. We believe that each salesperson should have at least five friends, buddies, people, that they know who sell a non-competitive product, but sell a related product into the same marketplace. Uh, and to actively meet with those five people, not 25 people, just five. And they allow you to understand uh, what's happening in the industry, maybe what's happening at a certain account. One of those five people are gonna bring a deal to that salesperson maybe once a quarter. Mm -hmm. So over the period of the year, those people might be able to bring four or five extra opportunities that that salesperson didn't get. Um, third thing that I thought I like to suggest is find a friend, uh, another salesperson in your company, uh, and do a weekly sales strategy conversation. Kind of have your own little peer group where the two of you meet uh, on Mondays, on Fridays, I don't care, Wednesday nights, uh, and discuss each other's opportunities to see what strategies I'm not using or what strategies are working so that you share those kinds of thoughts and hold each other accountable for not only activity, but maybe increase the number of eyes and intimate eyes on what the, what's happening on your accounts and maybe come up with different ways to close the opportunities. Lastly, um, that's the sales manager's really important role is that the sales manager may need to make a second call with that salesperson, uh, get more eyes and more ears on that opportunity to increase the the win-loss ratio on the opportunity. So those are about the th three or four things I would think about. Yeah, and I really like what you're saying there about them meeting with the other sales rep. Um, what I used to do at one organization is actually I would get the the you know the regional VP and then his team. It was normally maybe you know four or five salespeople every so often to do a sale what we used to call sales ops calls. And every salesperson would bring a deal that they're working on and they would outline it to the group and they'd actually get ideas and input from their peers on how they might uh, stra you know, strategically approach it or how they might move it forward. So, I mean, I always like that idea of, um, you know, getting another set of eyes. Um, 
Meredith, how about you? What are some of the things, how would you advise a salesperson when quota seems to be out of reach and the year slipping away? You know, the first thing that um, that we've we've got to do is we've got to get the smell or the, um, or the stink of desperation <laughs> off of you. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, because the hardest time to ever close a deal is when you need the deal um, to close. So, um, I mean, you know, it, it just it, it won't close. So so and and I mean, I think the very first thing is that we've got to get your um, your head around it in in that we're going to continue to um, to work, to do the behaviors, to move forward. If you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. We're going to learn from it. But that is you've got to get that desperation um, off of you. And. <clears throat> You know, Ken said this in the in the sense that you need a coach. Somebody has got to be looking at what you're doing and you know where you're um why you're not winning deals or you're choosing the wrong prospect or you you know is something um wrong in your you know in the way that you're um asking questions are you struggling to turn it to um you know to turn it to a close so that would be my second to really get in there and have somebody look at what you're doing and and what and what you can uh, what you can change up the other thing is that whenever people have a quota and they're really struggling to get there um, and it doesn't look like they're going to make it. I always tell people to sell inside out and that is to go back to your existing um, customers. I have never ever in my career worked with a company that has cross sold, deep sold, whatever upsold, whatever you want to um, call it, their customer base to the level they need to be. And that salesperson has people who like them, who trust them and are willing to do business with them. And, and that salesperson, if they're struggling to hit quota, needs to go back to their existing customers, see who has the need or assume they have a need and go out and have some conversations. That'll get you some instant wins. It'll also take away that um, smell of desperation, boost your confidence, and then you can make the adjustments and things that you need to go forward. Yeah, I love it. I love that idea of getting the smell of desperation <laughs> off you because, yeah, because it, as uh, you know, customers are very good at smelling that, right? Yes. Yeah. Especially, especially in today's economy, you know, the very fact that things are shifting and shaky and they're up, they're down. If you are not confident, people, it's almost like a disease. They don't want to get too close. Right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, it sounds silly, but I always say it's the very first thing you've got to get rid of. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, and Roy, uh, how about you? What are what are a couple of uh, remedial things a salesperson can do if their year is slipping away? Yeah, just to add on to to the desperation, I love that. Get the smell of desperation. <laughs> it, it, typically, when when, it, when I see a person or when I smell a person like that, <laughs> they start flogging at me. It's it's like the desperation <laughs> act is to flog, which is exactly. Uh, counterproductive in terms of what you want them to do. But so I, I love that. Thank you for that. I'm going to use that. I hope you don't have any residuals that I have to pay. No, no. no. Right? And from the stage, I usually say stink. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. we, we know it's that bad. I'll, well, being Canadian, I'll put an A on the end of it. And so, <laughs> yeah. um, so there's only a couple of points I want to raise here. And and the first one is, is what I would call, like we, we talked earlier about you know, the need for reps to have uh, a game plan in terms of how they're going to achieve their quota. What I used to do is um, I used to insist that every one of them also build what I would call a quota recovery plan. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that you're not going to make it. Okay, so if you're spending 50 hours or whatever developing the plan, I want to see another 50 hours um, spent on what you're going to do when the plan falls short. I had I, I wanted people to understand that don't get really baked in to the existing plan you've got. Your existing how-to plan is probably not going to work that you think the way you think it's going to. And I wanted to see some quality thinking around what am I going to do when things don't turn out? So some of the things that I've heard already, like let's get back to the A-list and look at opportunities to do more is is probably would be an element of what I would call my QRP. But there's kind of other elements in here that I think that I think reps should be should be thinking about. I mean, they they, they all have a, a B client list. OK, secondary targets, for example, if they're not included in plan A, make sure that they have that. Make sure they got a go to small focus list with some decent potential. If, in fact, going back to the 
to the A-list to do other things doesn't work out. There may be ways for marketing to help them in terms of promotional efforts. And, and hell, I, I had marketing offer deferred payment plans to a, a, a segment of, of sales reps selling high tech um, uh, and end user technology uh, that was actually very, very useful in getting those, those clients to decide to buy now as opposed to later. Referrals from A-list clients is actually uh, was actually quite productive as well, getting them actually engaged in the process to sort of help get us back on on target. So those are a couple of things that that could actually be included in a recovery plan. But I insisted, if you have a game plan to get your recovery, I want a game plan to when when you, when you actually realize that you're going to fall short. You need to have that discipline. The other thing just related to that, and I'll stop, mm -hmm. is this whole issue about tracking your own performance. Um, it, there's no sense finding out in October that you're not going to make it. And, and basically, um, I, I created this process called a running sales outlook so that every month, and it was less, you know, obviously less um, productive in the early months of the year, but eventually you got enough volume to be able to spot a tipping point when you suspected the, the quota was in jeopardy. That's when we need these guys to act, not looking back on it, but looking at it in real time. Yes. And then the only reason, the only way that I could get them to, to understand that is to have them run a, an outlook process every 30 days or even more granular if, if they could do it so that they were able to understand what the run rate on the outlook was or run rate on the quota was and what the implications of that were on year, year to uh, year to uh, end, end of the year results. And if, if there was a, if it looked like they were falling away, then let's get busy on executing this recovery plan. Let's not be waiting around and let's just get on it. Okay. And that seemed we're, to have we're, some success. We're, yeah, we're bumping up against time a little bit. So I'm going to take that as your quick tip on, on how to manage your quota better is um, leading indicators. Make sure you have a plan on leading indicators. Um, Ken, what quick tip would you have on how to manage your quota better? Don't get hung up on 12 month quotas. Uh, run a six month quota program, run a six month compensation plan if you're tied to it. Keep it simple, allows you to adjust if you have to. Perfect. And Meredith, what's your quick tip for how to manage your quota better? Let go of your ego. Just because it worked in first quarter doesn't mean that it'll work in second quarter. Be very open to hold yourself accountable. Learn from your uh, behaviors. Be ready to flex and change. Excellent. I like it. Okay. Well, starting with you, Meredith, how can people contact you? They can contact me at valuespeaker.com, valuespeaker.com. You'll find my blogs there as well as my social uh, networks. And I would love to connect with, um, with any of your audience. They can also find my articles on Pipeliner. Yeah, absolutely, on salespop.pipelinersales.com. <laughs> yeah. And how about you, Ken? How can people uh, contact you? Uh, our company is called acumenmanagement.com, acumenmanagement.com. My blog is Your Sales Management Guru, Your Sales Management Guru.com. Excellent. And Roy, how can people contact you? Uh, yeah, my website is uh, be different or be dead.com. And so I can be contacted through there. I have a blog on there. I blog every week. Plus, I, I'm as well on the sales pop on a, mm -hmm. on a fairly regular basis. Uh, and, and again, to echo what everybody else is saying, be delighted to engage, have a conversation, and be of any help that I can. Great. Well, again, this was a fantastic uh, panel discussion on quota attainment brought to you by PipelinerSales.com. As I said, we have a new version out. I, I encourage you to go and uh, download a trial if you haven't already. And by Sales Pop Magazine, uh, online sales magazine, where you will find all of our panelists today and you will find the recording of this uh, fantastic discussion. So we're, we're out of time. Uh, so I'm going to end it here. Uh, I think this, uh, this has been a really robust conversation. And I think if you go back and listen to this again, you're going to get some real gems out of it that can help you all with quote attainment. So I encourage you to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. So uh, again, uh, thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Roy. And uh, we'll see you all again soon for another panel discussion. Bye now.